Iranian students continue to hold more than 50 hostages at the American Embassy in Tehran this morning. Instead of chasing all the Americans out of the embassy, the Iranians imprisoned them somewhere on these grounds. They blindfolded us, tied our hands behind our backs. They have been hostages ever since. 60 Americans are now beginning another day of captivity. 87th day of captivity for American hostages. Khomeini's speech was viewed as a signal by the Muslims to attack the embassy. 172nd day for American hostages in Iraq. The embassy in Tehran had been overrun by so-called students. And at that point, 60-some Americans were being held hostage. From that day, the full focus of the entire organization was on the Eagle Claw operation. The mission was supposed to occur on the night of April 24, 25th, 1980. It was decided that we needed to send in an advance party to do last minute reconnaissance. General Bot said, okay, son, can you go get your tickets to Tehran? And once you get into Tehran, you're gonna be joined by Dick Meadows. We were looking for experience in figuring out and designing the breaching charges for the wall, disarming booby traps where the hostages were held if we ran into any. In the EOD field, when the hostages were moved or the situation changed, we had to then uh, replan, retrain, and we really needed to get this thing right. But where exactly inside that 27-acre compound were the hostages. We had to plan on clearing that entire compound. Everybody that found any hostage would consolidate in the back right corner where they'd blow a hole in the wall, would cross over the street into the soccer stadium and fly everybody to Manzuria. There were no long-range helicopters that could fly from a carrier all the way into Tehran, conduct a mission, and then recover. We had to establish a refuel site that became known as Desert One. The idea was to land the aircraft on this airfield and bring in the helicopters and wet refuel them right there on the desert strip. We were doing parallel runway ops in the middle of the desert. You couldn't see, say, 100 feet across because it was just all obscured with sand. I could see the helicopter as it picked up and moved, and I, I saw it. It looked like a big praying mantis sitting on top of the C-130 uh, with the blade strike and the big flash and the big flame shooting up. The media splash there, in fact, were Americans of Iranian descent involved in a mission, and that put the advance party under great danger. That's where my life, as I knew it, it just closed up on me. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm dead, I'm done. And I just turned the TV on, and all I see is a crash site. They were carrying the bodies of the eight individuals that got burned. Two of our American aircraft collided on the ground following a refueling operation in a remote desert location in Iran. It is the 1970s, and the world is confronting a new phenomenon, terrorism. Groups targeting civilians for assassination and kidnapping need to be dealt with. So Britain's legendary Special Air Service, or SAS, takes on additional counterterrorism duties. Germany follows suit by creating the GSG-9. And in 1977, after years of advocating for a U.S. counterterrorism unit, Colonel Charlie Beckwith is finally authorized to begin recruiting and training for Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, Delta Force. Colonel Beckwith was looking for perseverance and endurance and the ability to carry on when all the odds seemed against you. You have to remember that we, we started from scratch and the one thing about Colonel Beckwith was that he wanted, quote unquote, the right cut of cloth. By November of 1979, the team is declared fully mission capable. Just days later, the embassy in Tehran is seized. I think it was around probably the 10th or something like that of November that they started putting us uh, into a posture to respond and uh, we started moving into isolation into serious planning. Mission planners determine the months of November through April offer the best conditions, long nights to provide the cover of darkness, and cooler weather which increases the engine efficiency of their limited range aircraft. As weeks turn into months of captivity for the hostages, a desolate landscape in Yuma, Arizona has become the rescue team's training ground. 
Aside from desert dust storms, nearly every potential hazard can be simulated in Yuma. Planners are satisfied the exercises are comprehensive and realistic. The rescue mission will require 118 commandos, an assault on the foreign ministry, plus an assault on the embassy to locate and liberate the bulk of the hostages. We had to plan on clearing that entire compound, you know, going to the most logical places first, and the rest of it that was difficult. Especially when you're in a city as big as Tehran and, and you know that, you know, getting this thing done in 30 minutes or less is important to your health. Somewhere in that process of hostage consolidation, uh, they'd make a call on the SATCOM radio and that's when the 53s pick our guys up and the hostages and fly everybody to Montserrat. Multiple Sea Stallion helicopters will serve as the escape craft. The pickup point is the soccer stadium across the street. From there, it's on to Manzaria, where Army Rangers will have seized an airstrip and brought in C-141s to fly the Delta operators and hostages to safety. The stallions will need to be destroyed and left behind. Executing such a plan today would be expedient, with ABSOC CV-22s providing transportation through every stage of the mission for a total round-trip ton of only eight hours. But in 1980, the limited range and load capacity of the Sea Stallions creates the need for a refueling stop and a 35-hour plan that is far more complicated. The capabilities of, uh, of the aircraft that were available in those days were very limited compared to what they are now. The mission will take place in two nights. On night one, six C-130s take off from a small island off the coast of Oman. Three planes to carry the Delta Force operators, the other three to carry fuel bladders like giant waterbeds filled with 18,000 gallons of jet fuel. Following the C-130s, eight Sea Stallion helicopters launched from the USS Nimitz. You had all four services coming together to be put together for the mission. All but one Navy pilot said, I'm not trained for this mission, so that's when the Marines came in to fly the 53s. The stallion's refueling point is a sand-packed plateau in the Dashti Kabir Desert, codenamed Desert One. We had designated places where those aircraft would land, and then to uh, bring the helicopters in behind them was really a touchy situation. There was a lot of tight maneuvering to get that helicopter up close enough where the hose would reach. Here, the operators will board the Sea Stallions and relocate closer to the Iranian capital, to Desert 2, where they will spend the night. The Sea Stallions will be hidden until their eventual flight to the stadium, and Delta Force operators will be taken into Tehran by cargo trucks secured days earlier by the undercover advance team led by Dick Meadows, now hiding out in a warehouse. It is dusk on April 24, 1980, day 173 of the hostage crisis. Forecasters predict perfect weather conditions as the aircraft commence takeoff. But 125 miles into the flight, they encounter a Middle East weather phenomenon they didn't expect. A suspended cloud of sand known as a haboob. Despite near zero visibility, the C-130s push through the dust storm and arrive at Desert One. The habu that we encountered coming in went right over the landing zone. And so it isn't like running on hard pavement or on a dry lake bed, that you're treasured through the sand. So the whole timing factor of what we thought we could do in the amount of time changed. They wait for the eight Sea Stallion helicopters but not all show up. And we, we uh, went through uh, all kinds of activities there waiting on the helicopters to arrive. And then we were informed that uh, the last critical helicopter was not operational. I can remember the one uh, word in all caps on the operation schedule and it said, if less than six helicopters leave Desert One, and the one word in all caps was abort. Um, and so while they were refueling, one of them had, uh, you know, got misoriented and ended up with the accident with the 130. I could see the helicopter as it picked up and moved, and I, I saw it. It looked like a big praying mantis sitting on top of the C-130 uh, with the blade strike and the big flash and the big flame shooting up. 
there was just utter confusion everywhere. Suddenly there was a huge fireball off to my right and that, as it turned out, was the helicopter crashing into the C-130, which was a fuel bird, and uh, the fuel then igniting. When the blades hit the vertical fin of that 130, we were looking right at it. I mean, it was, you know, very, very close. I mean, a couple hundred feet. So now you've got all this fire. It looked like a big spider crawling all the way down the top of the aircraft and it ended up coming to rest right over the cockpit. And then, of course, ammo started going off. And, of course, with all those engines running, sucking those flames back along the, you know, the fuselage, I mean, it was one big fireball. And then, of course, people started streaming off the aircraft coming through the flames. And we started loading some of them. Some of them were burned a little bit and some of them badly. And, you know, we're providing first aid. And, and we started taking them aboard the other air aircraft also, started taking people aboard. The uh, bird, as we took off, got misaligned a little bit, did damage to the, to the undercarriage. And we were not at all sure whether we we're going to make it out of there or not. I mean, we, it was almost like we were going to tip over. And when we did, we lost an engine. And uh, we ended up limping out very slowly. Ended up being the last aircraft out of Iranian airspace. Fuel leaking all over the place, injured people. It was a very long ride. That event, in my view, probably is one of the most successful failures in, in history because it really led directly to the creation of the current Special Operation Forces that we have today and eventually the creation of U.S. OCOM. Two of our American aircraft collided on the ground following a refueling operation in a remote desert location in Iran. Construct our national defenses. By restoring America's military credibility, we intend to keep the peace. We will also keep our freedom. The simple white markers of Arlington National Cemetery, they add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. For our freedom. For our freedom. my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Danger Battalion study relief maps of the Italian coast. In Asia, opposing large numbers of enemy with fuel resources was unmatched. These frogmen are underwater warriors. As a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. The opportunities I have described today will determine the future of peace in this world. We are part of something larger than ourselves. The 2nd Airborne disabled any aircraft General Noriega could use to get to the Operation Desert Storm unleashed oh, special oh, forces no. deep into the enemy territory. It's very important that I not forget those things. This country will hunt down terrorists and bring them to justice. We cannot permit the future to be marred by terror and fear. States has conducted an operation that killed the leader of Al-Qaeda. We will reinforce old alliances and form new ones and unite the world against radical Islamic terrorism, which we will eradicate completely from the face of the earth. The U.S. military dropped what's known as the mother of all bombs on an ISIS cave complex in Nangahar. Coalition forces killed several Taliban fighters over the weekend. This is Liberation Day in Iraq. The Prime Minister announced the final defeat of ISIS, driven from the last pocket of territory they still held. Baghdadi once called himself the ruler of the most brutal terrorist group in history. His final hideout, now just a hole in the ground. On point was the Army's highly secretive Delta Force. Our servicemen and women are part of a new and a truly great generation. We will show 